Hey guys, welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about the main differences between DNA and RNA and some of the similarities. So if you are following along on the notes, you should be on the second page where you will have this image right here, which is the image you see on the screen. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and just pull up so we can talk about them. Um, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And so I would like you to underline the D, the N, and the A. And that's why we call DNA DNA. D, deoxyribo, N, nucleic, A, acid. Okay. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So I do need you to underline that R in ribo, N, nucleic, A, acid. DNA is double-stranded, and if you remember, DNA is in the shape of a double helix, whereas RNA is single-stranded. DNA has four bases, and RNA has four bases, but one of the bases does change. So in DNA, you have adenine that binds with thymine, so A binds with T, and cytosine binds with guanine, so C binds with G. The difference being, in RNA, there is no thymine. You should never see a T in RNA. So adenine binds with U, which is uracil. So that's a really important difference between DNA and RNA is RNA does not have any Ts, does not have thymine, it has uracil. And C binds with G, still the same as it does in DNA. So DNA contains the instructions for life, meaning it contains the blueprints for every gene in your body and how to make a, every single protein in your body. However, RNA is like the recipe to make proteins. And so RNA is just going to code for one single gene, and it's going to provide the instructions for making a single protein. And so because of that, RNA is much smaller than DNA, because if you remember, DNA has thousands of genes on each chromosome. So DNA is huge. RNA, however, is just one gene. So it's much, much smaller. And RNA is single-stranded, not double-stranded, so that makes it even smaller. And then lastly, DNA cannot leave the nucleus. It cannot leave the nucleus because it's huge. It can't fit out of the nucleus. It's too big. So what we need to do is figure out a way to get that information on the DNA out to the cytoplasm. Because in the cytoplasm are ribosomes where we make the proteins. So how on earth are we supposed to get from the nucleus to the ribosome if we can't leave the nucleus? And that's where RNA comes in. RNA is going to basically be the messengers um, and take the recipes that we need from the nucleus to the cytoplasm because RNA can leave through those nuclear pores, whereas DNA can't. Uh, one more thing I forgot, uh, DNA, the five carbon sugar in this one is deoxyribose. And in RNA, the five carbon sugar is just ribose. Okay, D, deoxyribose, R, ribose. So I do want you on your notes to, of course, have all of this down, but also take note. So if you look the image on your left, that is DNA. How do I know that? Well, number one, it's double stranded. Two, if you look closely, there is a thymine that tells you, hey, this is DNA thymine's present. The one on the right is RNA. Just from looking at it, I can say, hey, it's single-stranded, that's RNA. And also, there is uracil telling me this is RNA. There is no thymine present, only uracil. Well, what do DNA and RNA have in common? They're both nucleic acids, aka the Na part. And because of nucleic acids, they're made up of nucleotides. Okay, so something else to note, okay? If you're looking at DNA, what binds with what? Well, you know that A binds with T, so A binds with T, and G binds with C. So there was this scientist named Chargraff, and basically what he did was he found that the percentages of A, percentages of adenine in the DNA, equaled the percentages of thymine. So through this, he determined that adenine binds with thymine, which makes sense because for every A you would need a T, and that guanine, the percent of guanine, tended to equal or be very close to the percentage of cytosine, meaning that G bonds with C. And so Chargraff actually discovered what binds with what, what base pairs together. 
Um, so if we're looking at this chart and this question, it says using Trigraph's rules, what are the most likely percentages of C and T in the rat DNA sample? So if we look at the rat DNA sample, we see that there is 28.4% of A. Well, A binds with T, so we can assume that T would be around 28% as well, because for every A, you would need a T, okay? Um, so that kind of gives us the answer away, but let's go ahead and do the cytosine one as well. So the percent guanine is 21.4%. Again, guanine binds with cytosine. So for every guanine, you would need a cytosine. So you would expect your cytosine to be around 21.4% as well. So the answer choice for this one would be B. Okay, and you're gonna have some of these questions to do on the worksheet. Um, so just refer back to this, watch this again, and it, um, as always, if you don't understand something or you need me to clarify something, you um, can definitely send me an email or text me on Remind. Okay, this is the end of day one.